to the second part of the morning. And we are having uh, Jana Safonova from John Hopkins University. Are you okay? And uh, she will be talking about profiling of uh, antibody repertoires, which is also a very interesting topic. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Jana. And today I'm going to tell about computational analysis of antibody repertoire and immunoglobulin lacite. So this topic is closely related to studying diseases. And past two years showed us that there's still a lot of work because we can see newly immersed viruses and already immersed viruses accumulate new mutations. And of course, we are interested in answering questions how our body can respond to all these new threats. So when we talk about fighting diseases, we of course mean studying immune systems. And there are two types of immune systems in our body. The first one is innate and the second is adaptive. So the innate immune system is encoded in the germline directly and mechanism of it work in the same way across all people. So it's easy to predict how it would behave. Uh, on the other side, adaptive immunity is not encoded in the genome directly and it's highly unique to an individual. So there are two main components of adaptive immunity. B cells producing antibodies and T cells producing T cell receptors. Today we will talk mostly about antibodies. Antibodies can be viewed as a, such a wide shaped protein and it has a special feature. It can recognize and neutralize pathogens or pathogenic particle and we will use a monological term antigen when we will talk about this. So usually one distant antibody can neutralize and recognize one distinct antigen. Of course, it's not always a rule, but uh, still in order to recognize a lot of different antigens, we need to develop a lot of different antibodies. And it's very hard to encode all of them in the genome directly. So that's why they present a result of special process. So first of all, let's look at this process and discuss what distinct antibodies mean. Um, antibodies are developed by B cells that have unique genomes in places called immunoglobulin lasci. So in all other genes, this immunoglobulin lasci look like this. They present a family of B genes, where V stands for variable, D genes, D stands for diversity, and J genes, where J stands for joining. In B cells, this immunoglobulin lasci look different. And more specifically, they are affected by a special process called VDG recombination that randomly selects one gene from each of these families and concatenate them together, thus producing gene encoding one of antibody chains. It's called VDJ sequence. So the diversity of antibodies is primarily based on the diversity of VDJ recombinations. And this process is not that simple. It also includes a lot of small events on the VD and TJ junctions. So non-genomic nucleotides can be inserted and also prefaces and suffixes of these genes can be removed. So the diversity of VDJ sequences is truly huge. But that's not the end uh, because that's how we just generate the primary diversity. Once antibody binds an antigen, immune system marks that's useful and produce multiple copies of corresponding B cell but it also introduces small changes inside antibody genes in order to improve binding properties of this antibody. And this process can be viewed as an evolutionary process that happens really fast. Just within several days, we can observe that a single antibody is turned into a family of antibodies. Some of these mutations can be good, some of them can be bad. Uh, there are additional processes that controls uh, bad antibodies and eliminate them from this tree and promote good antibodies. So as a result, antibody repertoires, uh, that's how we will call a collection of antibodies in a single body, are extremely diverse. And we are interested in question how we can study them. So fortunately, modern sequencing technologies allow us to sequence subsets of antibody repertoires using aluminumisec or by CCS because the VDJ sequences are not that long. They are about 400 nucleotides, so we can cover them with a single read. And if we design specific primers to cover VDJ sequences, then we can collect VDJ sequences from a set of B cells and uh, analyze these antibody repertoires as a set of sequences. 
So what kind of questions we can answer using this analysis? Um, of course, we are interested in translating antibody repertoires into antibody responses. And here is a picture of uh, from one early paper about uh, COVID responses when the mRNA vaccine was developed. And it was tested on people who were exposed to COVID, so they are recovered patients, and on naive donors who never seen COVID. So you see that uh, after the vaccination is here, responses go up in both groups. However, we still see that these distributions are truly wide, and some people respond much worse compared to others. And also the medium value still goes up, and that's what we expect to see, so the vaccine works. We're still interested in explaining this variance. And using uh, repertoire sequencing data can give us some answers how to explain this. So uh, we still see antibody repertoires as a collection of sequences. So the simplest way would be just to see overlap between two the set of fine shared sequences. But unfortunately, it doesn't always work. And for many diseases, we don't see such public repertoire of antibodies at all. And even if we see them, they might represent just frequent VDJ recombination and not necessarily be functional and important antibodies. However, surprisingly, it's exactly what we see for COVID, and I will come back to this. Um, but for most cases, it doesn't work, so we need to understand some other representative features. And one of those features could be variation in original germline BDNJ genes. So currently we see a lot of such associations detected by multiple groups. For example, uh, for influenza virus, we see that most responsive antibodies are derived from the same gene, IGHV169. And this gene is highly polymorphic. And when we see variations in these genes, we sometimes see that people carrying homozygous variation uh, of one type actually lose the ability to develop these antibodies. So variations in these genes can be truly important. But there are a lot of these genes. We, we have 55 V genes, 27 D genes, and 7 J genes. So it means that there could be other antibodies that can compensate for some disadvantages alleles. So how we can study this? That's a complex problem and it's still a work in progress. And I will just to give you just some example how it works for COVID. For example, when the pandemic just started, uh, a lot of antibody repertoires were sequenced and these repertoires were res respond responders to the original virus. It was surprising to see that a lot of donors developed the same antibodies. So that's actually contradicts with what I said, but it was a truly big surprise for me. So they currently refer to as stereotypic and they have very conserved signature. So they derived from uh, one of these two V genes, 353 or 366. And they also have a recombination of D and J genes that looks like this. So if we resemble this motif and have one of these two genes, then surprisingly, these antibodies can re recognize the original version of coronavirus very well. And they target uh, the RPD part of the spike protein, but unfortunately, they glue to the top part that accumulates most mutation. So when, viruses, uh, when the virus mutated, these antibodies actually became useless. And that's a very sad story because they represent the immune dominant part of the response. So they develop in most people and we see that they actually are the most popular antibodies. But we still need to live with this somehow. And uh, in addition to this antibodies, we still developed a lot of others. So our goal is to see not dominant responses and analyze how they can be useful in new versions of the virus. So recently we published a paper where we analyzed a subset of neutralizing antibodies and we actually derived one common feature in them. So we uh, called it YYD XXG. And this is a motif that actually allows antibodies to bind a more conservative part of RBD. And they can re uh, recognize and neutralize not only the original versions of the virus, but also some Omicron subvariants, other existing variants such as Delta, Beta, and Gamma, and also SARS-1 and MERS. 
So you see that there is a different class of antibodies. They still bind RBD, but they are much more versatile. So when, then we decided to see what is a fraction of these antibodies in the population. And it was very pleasant to see that in unexposed people, the fraction of these antibodies is 4%, which is extremely high. So it means that it's very easy to develop such antibodies. And that's a hope for future vaccine design. So even if these antibodies are dominant and practically useless, although it's a bit of, of an overreaction, these antibodies still can be boosted. And maybe with a slight change of uh, vaccine where this part can be more exposed, we can actually change the production of good antibodies. So you see that uh, this two different types and they are derived from different V and D genes. So the antibodies are basically derived from D gene 322. And we are interested in studying this picture, uh, a more general picture, how all genes can develop immune responses, how they communicate with each other. So we started with gene V366, and we analyzed a cohort of healthy people. And for these people, we sequenced the immunoglobulin lasci before PDG recombination, so germline uh, composition of this lasci, and also antibody repertoires. So for all these people, we listed a list of single nucleotide polymorphisms and performed QTL analysis with expression of each of these genes. For gene 366, you can see that there is a spot where a lot of SNPs are associated with the usage of this gene. And it's actually a pretty wide spot, but there is a smaller spot that uh, flanks specifically this gene and has all top association that's approximately five kilobases. And we also saw that there are a lot of regulatory elements that modulate the three-dimensional architecture of the locus. And it actually creates an additional level of complexity. So we not only need to know how specific genes can respond to specific pathogens, but we also need to know how it all uh, orchestrated together. And when we extended this analysis to other genes, we saw that the same region controls the production of many other genes. For example, I mentioned V169 that is associated with flu. It's also controlled by this region. So it actually gives us hope that we can unravel all this uh, production and understand what kind of antibodies can be developed in the context of different antigens. But unfortunately, that's still not it. Uh, or maybe fortunately. So we still see that antibodies are product of EDG recombinations. So variations are not only factors that influence the production of antibodies. And if you, for example, move to HIV, a very tricky pathogen that accumulates a lot of mutation during the course of disease, then we'll see that many neutralizing antibodies present the result not a VDG recombination, but VDDG recombination. And that's an abnormal event. It was observed on the very small fractions. And for a long time, it wasn't known if it's just some sort of a glitch or if it's a systematic feature. So uh, we decided to analyze it and we collected such D diffusions across different individuals. The fraction is indeed low and we decided to explain it. So to explain this, we need to look at the process of VDG recombination in more detail. Um, all immunoglobulin genes are flanked by special sequences called RSSs, recombination signal sequences, and there are two types of them. So let's call one of them key and another of them log. So keys only can be recombined with log and RSS signals of the same time can be recombined together. That's how uh, this VDJ recombination process is guided. So as a result, we only create VDJ recombinations. So we hypothesized then maybe digits sometimes have cryptic logs. And if you just uh, drop this metaphor, then you'll see that these RSSs are practically conservative seven mer and conservative nonomer that are separated by different number of nucleotides, 23 for keys and 12 for logs. So maybe we just need to look for conserved nonomers for digits 
that I seen in this tandem fusions. And that's how EDG recombination can mistaken them for V genes or J genes and create this additional step. So when we look at the human genome, just the standard reference, we indeed found conserved non-amers at uh, distance 23 for digits. And that's how we could predict tandem fusions. And when we met this information about observed diffusion, we could explain our observation, 95% of our observation. So that's actually a really nice result because now we can say this, uh, VDDJ recombinations are not just a glitch, but that's actually a real feature of antibody repertoire. And as soon as people have the script technonomers, we can rely on their production. And this can be a basis of development of vaccine for HIV. Um, so I just want to give you one more example how diverse features of antibodies could be. And for this, let's move from human to cows. Uh, so cows have a unique immune system and uh, it looks like that can be true for a lot of diff different species. Uh, but we started working on cows as an application of the same tools for studying responses in them. So cows are susceptible to this bovine respiratory disease response. It's a very costly disease. Uh, it can be treated and it can only be prevented using uh, vaccine. And even in a population of purebred cows, our collaborators observed, again, really wide distribution. So genetically similar cows respond to the same vaccine very, very differently. And we decided to study why this is happening. But before we did it, we needed to learn some specifics about cows. And when I said that they have special immune system, I meant that they also have a fraction of antibodies produced by the recombination of the same VDNJ genes that result in a super long antigen binding loop called CDR3. And if you look at sequences of the CDR3s, you'll see that they have a lot of cysteines at different positions. And all these cysteines correspond to the same D-gene, DA2. It's a pretty long D-gene, so that's how ultra-long antigen binding site is created. And if you look at it, we'll see that it's composed of multiple codons differing from cysteine by a single substitution. So using somatic hypermutations, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, these antibodies can create cysteines at different positions. And that's actually one of advantages of cows because when we observe cysteines just in a loop, they form disulfide bonds. And instead of just being a loop, they can form very diverse structures. So they actually develop additional mechanism for diversification of antibodies in addition to VDJ recombination diversity. And instead of being just different from the point of view of sequences, they are different from the perspective of structures. And that's absolutely unique feature. And we still don't know when exactly it emerged. It looks like it's also present at some level in deers and giraffes. But uh, what actually was the reason of this, we still don't know. So when we analyzed our data, we actually saw that the only component of immune system that is boosted by this vaccine is a fraction of ultralong antibodies. So they are responders to the vaccine. And we see that they kind of correlate, positively correlate uh, with the final responses, although this correlation uh, is not that great as we wanted it to be. So we decided to apply the same methods as we did for humans. We detected variations in germline genes. We identified clusters of genetically similar animals. So here we analyze three clusters in order to like make them larger, but you see that there are smaller groups. This is just a PCA representation of genotypes. And we saw that these genotypes first associated with responses to the vaccine, but also in the clusters that has higher responses to the vaccine, this correlation is much better as compared to the whole population. So we actually identified a subset of animals where fraction of ultralong antibodies is better correlated with responses. And now we can analyze how exactly it works. And actually, because these are cows, people are interested in breeding cows, these animals can be used for future breeding. And these ones can be ignored. Uh, 
Um, so that shows that, first of all, methods can be used for other animals. We now have projects not only for agricultural animals, but on, on also for uh, critically endangered animals in order to keep them healthier, like we work, for example, on black-footed ferrets with Smithsonian Zoo. But on the other hand, it also shows us how diverse immune systems are. And it makes sense because the only thing that uh, shapes them is the ability to recognize pathogens, and you can do it in very different ways. So we got interested in this, and we decided to analyze various mammalian species. Unfortunately, their genomes are currently available. For example, there is a vertebrate genome uh, project that has a lot of different species. We started with just with mammals. There were just one of them when we started this project two years ago. And we developed a tool called IG Detective. It scans the genome and the NOVA identifies immunoglobulin genes for species using both recombination signal sequence analysis and then relaxed search of immunoglobulin genes. So from this mammalian species, we identified more than 1,000 B genes. So the, this is a great source for new genes and their analysis. And there are different ways to look at it. Uh, and I will just talk about one of them. So this is an, a phylogenetic tree of all these V genes. And we can color them according to the number of cysteines that they have in their sequence. Again, cysteines, yeah, they are very important for immunoglobulins. So you see that most of them have two cysteines. They are called canonical, and they form a standard bond that actually shapes the conformation of antibody as a protein. But there is a family that have four cysteines. And when we analyze species uh, that are in this subgroup, we actually saw that most, most of them are bats. And this is interesting because we see that these two things emerge at the same position across all these genes, and they correspond to two other antigen binding loops. That's quite interesting because we usually think about antigen binding loops as something very flexible. It can be rotated, it can change its position, but if they have cysteines, and if the cysteines are fixed together, so it means that the composition of antibody is slightly different. It doesn't have this freedom. So we are interested what kind of antibodies they are. And there is a hypothesis that they could be highly stable and all bats can raise and drop their temperature in a very wide range. So humans can do it, humans get sick. Uh, and maybe these antibodies actually work in the circumstances because they have more stable and firm structure. So that is one of the sequences. And we actually also found this uh, regions in squirrels, but not in other rodents. And squirrels also have this temperature feature. So that's what we are trying to investigate now. And hopefully with analysis of more genomes, we can understand more about pathogen recognition. So thank you so much uh, for listening. I would like to thank my to my former postdoc advisors, Pavel Pevzer at UCSD, Corey Watson at University of Louisville, and of course, all my collaborators who are a huge part of this work. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so we have some questions. Yeah. We're interesting. Um, can you say a little bit more about how systematically you look for um, non-canonical VDJ recombinants, such as the DD fusions? For example, do you, was it, did you systematically try to find, for example, I don't know, duplications of J segments ever or triplicates of, v, of D? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So there were several hypotheses how to explain the diffusions and uh, when we collected immunoglobulin lasci sequences from these healthy individuals, we saw that duplication in the genes are practically non-existent. They only have deletions, but they still have the diffusion. So it's some process that emerges at, at the level of VDJ recombination. And there are additional features of this process that can uh, work in our favor. We always see that uh, this D diffusion follows the genomic order of D gene in the genome. So they never kind of come back. And it agrees with the process because it consecutively cuts 
uh, dynamic parts. Uh, there is no way to come back and connect DGNs that don't follow genomic order. So it's still possible in some cases, but I would say that there is a lot of evidence uh, for our hypothesis. Hi, great, great talk. Um, as far as I know, I may be mistaken, the bovine respiratory disease is caused by multiple, there are multiple pathogens associated with this disease. Um, how many different viruses are in the current vaccine that you looked at? And if there's more than one, um, how does that influence the selection patterns for the different V regions that you're seeing? I mean, what, what was the nature of the vaccine that was used? Was it multiple viruses, multiple organisms? Yes, that's a great question and a complicated one. So for, <clears throat> for cattle uh, vaccines, there is a mixture of four viruses. So the yeah, there are four, four viruses associated with this disease. And that's basically why in, another uh, source of uncertainty in our data, because we currently could see a mixture of different advantages and disadvantages. But uh, yeah, there is not that many work was put in development of vaccines, for example, for COVID. Uh, even flu vaccines that we currently use, it's still not super perfect because it's always a prediction uh, of previous uh, and incoming viruses. And sometimes it also can create suboptimal responses. That's why people get sick also in combination with all these variations. So right now I would say, again, this is just my opinion, uh, the most sophisticated methods for vaccine designs are currently implemented in COVID vaccines because this virus was dissected at a really uh, deep level. And even if we move to flu, then it's not that great. And hopefully that is going to be changed with all these new technologies. Um, and with uh, cows, these technologies are kind of like still 50 years old. So, so you really don't know if these were protective. You just really knew that they were titers. And this were the, because they, these weren't challenge experiments after the vaccine, right? So you would, you're really just looking at the clones, the sort of a clonal selection, uh, more than a protective set of antibodies in the case of the respiratory disease. So when we, uh, when I, say about this uh, responses in cows, that's actually uh, essays for neutralization. And uh, even though we have four viruses, they all were measured separately and then they were kind of combined together. So this number represented the response to all of them. Our colleagues analyzed this essays individually. They saw that they all kind of go up. So there are no outliers and that's why we decided that this metric is a good representation but still when we see that they go up there is still a distribution that some of them go up better than others and with respect to your second question i just want to give a brief overview that uh, sometimes we see very shared motifs in immunoglobulin genes across different species that are seen in highly diverse genes so genes themselves are different but the emotives are conserved. And that's, <clears throat> I think, where we can analyze uh, convergent responses to the same pathogens in different animals. And hopefully when we see antibodies derived from these genes, we can create these bridges and say, okay, it's really beneficial to have this motive in antibody in order to successfully recognize this pathogen because that's how it was selected by evolution. Okay, thank you so much. I think that we can move on to the next speaker, and we thank again Jenna for uh, for her talk. Thank you.